Buenos días, buenas tardes, buenas noches por parte de la Mediateca de la Escuela Nacional de Estudios Superiores de la eh, UNAM en la Unidad Morelia. Eh, les damos la bienvenida a este ciclo de conferencias. El, el, yo soy Jaime Chavoya por parte del de maestro eh, Eduardo Altamirano y el coordinador de estas conferencias y también de la maestra Karina Godina, la coordinadora de la Mediateca. Les damos la más cordial bienvenida y estamos muy contentos y contentas de poder compartir este ciclo de conferencias con ustedes. Estas conferencias están destinadas para ayudarles, acompañarles en su dominio, en su familiarización con idiomas extranjeras y eh, caminar con ustedes aprendiendo lenguas extranjeras. La conferencia de hoy lo voy a dar yo, Jaime Chavoya, soy un profesor en la Mediateca, yo doy algunos talleres, les voy a platicar de eso después, uh, y la conferencia se dará completamente en inglés y se llama Poetry Helps You Think in English. Y bueno, sin más eh, por la introducción, vamos a comenzar. Welcome, everyone. So, poetry can help you think in English. Now, that's kind of funny. Uh, we usually translate a lot of things as we begin learning a language. We go back to our mother language, and then we take it back to the destined to the destinatory language, uh, the destination language. And that is good. That's okay while you are beginning. But as you progress in learning English, you are expected to uh, start thinking in the destination language. So how does that happen? Well, it happens just by practice, really, and getting to know that there are things that you simply cannot translate. One of those things is poetry. Yes, there are efforts to translate different poets from Latin America into English and from English into Spanish and all the languages around the world. Yes, but it is a different process. It is a creation process and is not necessarily um, part of learning a language. Um, so when we look at poetry, we have an opportunity to read it in the original language and to try to understand the culture, the history, the evolution and history of the language, of the countries that are involved. Um, and the really cool thing about it is that it has a very flexible grammar and that there are different meanings for words. When you read poetry, you build all of these images in your head and they make sense at that moment and they will help you to remember the words a lot easier. Um, so some people say, well, I don't like poetry. <laughs> it's boring. It has complicated words. It's secretive, it's hermetic, um, but it is not always difficult. In fact, most poetry, not all poetry, but most poetry has no correct or incorrect interpretations. That is the beauty of art, is that once an artist, in this case, a poet, makes a poem and pushes it out into the world, and when you read it, it becomes yours. You are the one that will give it meaning, give it an interpretation. And so do not worry that you do not understand uh, a poem. If it doesn't make any sense, it's all right. Just keep on reading. The more you read, the more words you will learn and the more um, complicated structures of language you will be familiar with and you will also become more familiar with the cultures uh, that, that originated the poem. So, of course, you will remember more words and you will uh, improve your pronunciation. That it happens especially with poems that rhyme. When you find words that are rhyming, 
even if you do not know the word, you do not know what it means, you will be able to know how to pronounce it, which is a big step in the right direction. Why? Well, because maybe you know another word that with that it rhymes with. So core and door have the same sound. They rhyme. Maybe we do not know the meaning of core, but we do know door, like a door of a house. So you so if you see door and then the word core, you already know how to pronounce it. There are more benefits the more you read poetry and reading in general. You will not only learn more, more vocabulary, but your vocabulary will become more refined, um, more sophisticated, more educated, more cultivated. You will learn about the language, uh, the history of the language. What words have changed over the passing of time? Their meaning, their spelling. You will understand about metaphors and the images that they that they build inside of your heart, inside of your head. And you will also deepen your awareness of the cultures, whether it be of the United States, Canada, England. Scotland, any of the English speaking countries, you will learn more about the way they think, the way they feel, what kind of things are important in the culture. Those things go into poetry and they come into us. So there's lots of reasons to read poetry. If you get a chance to bump into some poetry, do not let it pass by. You will uh, definitely uh, benefit from it. So, first of all, don't be afraid. It's okay. Poetry is just a set of words and meanings and sounds. It's art. Here are some tips to read poetry. One, try your best not to translate. Try to understand the poem in the original language. There will be things that cannot be translated uh, word by word in a literal sense. If you take it into Spanish, it will make no sense at all. And then when you put it back into English, you're more confused than where you were before. So you don't do that. <laughs> it's not recommended. Another thing is, do not expect uh, poetry to be uh, an example of correct or strict grammar, syntax, or even spelling. This is because it is art. And the poet has extreme freedom to play with the language. So this is really good. You don't have to remember where the adverb goes or where the subject is uh, if it goes noun and verb and pronouns and stuff like that. Just go along and accept the, the logic that the poem gives you. If it's a fantastic poem, imagine all of these fantastic and um, supernatural things and accept the poem's rules. If the, rule, if the poem says, I want you to listen to the way the beat goes, they are talking about a metric. You have to go with that. And lastly, use your heart and your inner mind. Trust your intuition. If you find a poem that is obscure and difficult to understand, just take a, a breath, a deep breath, and feel what is the poem trying to say. More than likely, you will be very, very close to the original meaning of the poem. You can do that with words. If you find a word that seems to be related to nature, it probably is. That's just an example. So let's go now into a really basic example. This poem is called The Chaos. 
and it's from 1922 by Gerard Nostrenite. This man wrote a very, very long poem to help his English students and to reveal oh, hundreds of exceptions to the rules that we use in English. Yes, languages have rules, but languages also break those rules when it comes to pronunciation or spelling. Sometimes the word has certain letters and you would expect it to sound in a different, in a certain way. But in reality, the common use is pronounced differently. So this is how the poem begins. I'm going to read it. You can read along with me. Dearest creature in creation, studying English pronunciation. I will teach you in my verse. Sounds like corpse, core, horse, and worse. I will keep you, Susie, busy. Make your head with heat grow dizzy. Tear in eye, you'll dress, you'll tear. Queer, fair seer, hear my prayer. So, just looking at this poem, do not worry about what the meaning of the word is. Let's just look at the way they sound. So first of all, we do have, oops, we do have rhymes. Creation, pronunciation, verse, and look at this. It has a different spelling, but it has the same sound. Worse, verse, worse. And see, in the next uh, paragraph or the next stanza, we have busy, B-U-S-Y, busy. That will rhyme with dizzy. And then tear will rhyme with prayer. That's an example about how the rhymes will help us to, to know how to pronounce a word, even if we do not know what it means. If we do not know what the word worse means, maybe we do know the meaning of verse and we know how to pronounce it. We also know that these words are expected to rhyme. So we say verse. And then even if we don't know what worse is, we know how to pronounce it. Worse. Mm -hmm. That's some examples there. This poem is used to reveal a lot of inconsistencies in the language. So for example, we have all of these um, cases of similar spelling, O-R-S-E, O-R-S-E, O-R-P-S, and O-R-P-S but they all have a different pronunciation. The first one is pronounced corpse. Make sure you pronounce the S, corpse, corpse. The second word, you do not pronounce neither the P or the S, just C-O-R, core core. But here, the rule goes in a different direction. Horse. Horse. And then this one has a different sound. It almost sounds like a U. Worse. 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 There's more examples of how the rules are flexible in spelling and pronunciation. Here, busy spilled <clears throat> with a B-U-S-Y has the same sound as a double Z. Busy. 
It sounds, it has the same sound as dizzy. Busy, dizzy. So that's one example about how we can use these words, these poems to help our pronunciation. We can also use them to discover new words and increase our vocabulary. These are all very common words, just in as, a, as an example. A corpse, corpse, it's a body. Mm -hmm. Now the next one means core. Hmm. Have you heard of the Marine Corps? of the United States military, Marine Corps. It is a body, a collective body. It is an organization. So it is the corporation of the Marines, Corps, Corps. I think a lot of us already know the word horse. It's a farm animal and sometimes a wild animal. And then worse, is the opposite to best. On one side, you have something that excels, is very, very good. That is the best. And then you have the worst, which is last place. Very bad. See, you're already learning some new words. Now, how about busy? Well, it's when you're very occupied. And you can't, you do not have enough time to even sit down. You're busy, busy, busy. Dizzy is a word related to confusion. When you are losing your sense of balance. Those are just some examples about how we can use poetry. If you get a chance and you're interested in it, Look up The Chaos by Gerard Nolz Trinité. It is very, very long, but and it goes in alphabetical order. And it will give you, um, I don't know, maybe about, uh, maybe 300, 500, 800 different cases of how words, their pronunciation, and their spelling have exceptions. It's a really, really good resource to have. It will make you dizzy. It will leave you a little confused. But if you can read the entire poem, you are one of the very few people that is excelling in English. And I applaud you. You're going to do great. So now let's go to an advanced read. This is a poem by the famous poet, William Wordsworth. It's from the 19th century. And it is called, I Wandered Lonely as a Cloud. Let's read it. Let's read it together. I wandered lonely as a cloud that floats on high or vales and hills when all at once I saw a crowd, a host of golden daffodils beside the lake beneath the trees, fluttering and dancing in the breeze. We'll just take this first part, okay? Remember, this is a little bit more advanced. So if you do not understand everything, that's okay. You are still in the right direction. This poem also rhymes. So we have cloud, crowd. See how one uses a U and the other one uses a W? They make the same sound. Cloud. Crowd. Here's this one. Hills. Many people know the word hills. It's a small mountain. So how do you think we would pronounce this word? Yes, correct. You pronounce it daffodil. Hills, daffodils. And then, and then at the end, we have trees, and it rhymes with breeze. 
See how they have different spelling? One has an S, the other one has a Z and an E. That will help us with our pronunciation. Now, what about the, the words? This one looks funny. Or, this is a word that you will find a lot in Christmas songs, in poetry, and in classic literature. Notice that it has an apostrophe. What does the apostrophe indicate? It can indi indicate several things. Possession, for example, or property. And other times, it indicates a contraction. That means that there are letters missing. What does this word look like? What do you think the complete word is? You have or. What is the complete word? What is the letter that is missing? If you said V, you are correct. It, it's over. Over. Mm -hmm. As going above something. This is also very, uh, uh, very timely into Old English. Now, what's the next word? Veils. We see that the next word after this is hills, and that is a small mountain. It is very possible that veils has some relationship with geography. And if you thought valley, you are correct. So we have mountains. And we have the valleys down below. The valleys are down below. What about the other words? What about host? What does host mean? Host can mean, of course, when you welcome someone. I am your host for this conference. But it also has a more classic meaning, which is an army. Well, what does an army have to do here? Is this a military poem? No. It's a reference. It's building a metaphor. It's building a, an image. What is the image? The poet was walking and saw a crowd, which is a large group of something. A host. A crowd, a large group of something. A host, a large group of people, an army. But is it people? No. They are daffodils. Daffodils. Imagine you are walking and all of a sudden you see a meadow full of thousands and thousands of flowers. That is what a daffodil is. It's a specific kind of flower. I have some pictures up here. If you recognize this flower, whatever you call that flower in your own language, in English, we call them daffodils. And they are a very special flower in Wales. They are the national flower for Wales in England. Now, Let's continue. Continuous as the stars that shine and twinkle on the Milky Way. They stretched in never ending line along the margin of a bay. 10,000 saw I at a glance, tossing their heads in sprightly dance. Here we have some really good examples about how the poet will play with language. Notice that the that here 
our good friend William Woodsworth is using a, a passive voice and not an active voice, which is more common in, in uh, especially American English. Instead of saying, I saw at one glance 10,000 flowers, he puts it backwards. And he says, 10,000 saw I at a glance. Now, here's some words that are very common in conversations. These are not academic words, so you don't have to worry about being sophisticated or anything. These are words that you will use a lot in normal conversations. Twinkle. And twinkle is the way a, a star shines. It radiates irregularly. Sometimes at one second, it's very large and bright. And another second, it's very small. That's twinkle. St. Patrick's Day is coming up pretty soon. It will be on March 19th, I think, or March 17th. Talking about that, they say the Irish people have a twinkle in their eye. Here's another word, tossing. Tossing is when you throw something in a gentle way. So if tossing their heads, whose heads? The flower's heads. It means they're just going one way and another in a very gentle way. Let's continue reading. The waves be beside them danced, but they outdid the sparkling waves in glee. A poet could not but be gay in such a jocund company. I gazed and gazed, but little thought what wealth the show to me had brought. Notice also that we have more rhymes. They rhymes with gay, glee, rhymes with company, and thought rhymes with brought. Here's some examples about how we how our language has changed over time. Before 19 oh 60, 1970, something like that, the word gay meant happy. It had no political or any gender connotation to it. It meant happy. Happy. Glee is another word for happy. There are some television shows and you will uh, theater um, plays that are called glee. Happiness. Let's finish this poem. Oops, my, my pencil moved a little bit there. For oft, when on my couch I lie, in vacant or in a pensive mood, they flash upon that inward eye, which is the bliss of solitude. And then my heart with pleasure fills and dances with the daffodils. So here's one word. This is also a poetic freedom uh, and it also comes from more European English, and it comes from uh, Old English. So this is another chance to learn about how the language has changed over time. Oft. What do you think the modern word for oft is? What does it look like? If you're thinking about off. Then you are correct. Frequent, frequently, in a regular way, often.
So here we have another poem that gives us an opportunity to do more advanced practice with English. We can learn more about the culture. For example, the importance of the daffodil in Wales and for the crown of England. Remember, King Charles III is also the King of Wales. And how we can imagine what a country uh, scenery might look like if we had thousands of these daffodils growing there. This is a poem that shows us that not all poetry has to be about love or romance, things like that. This is uh, completely about happiness and how something like a flower can make our soul and our hearts fill with happiness. So just as a recap, and just to show you, um, reinforce a little bit about how we can use poetry for our English. How do you pronounce these words? S-U-S-Y, B-U-S-Y, D-I-Z-Z-Y. If you mentioned that they all have a Z sound, you are correct. The Z is common to all of them. Suzy. We don't we do not say susi as we do in Spanish. Susi. We say suzy. Suzy. That is the same for the next word. Busy. Busy. And the last one. Dizzy. Dizzy. Our next question. Do you remember what we said about the word corpse and core? What is the difference? Think about it. Remember, one has to do with a funeral and the other one has to do with an organization. What is the difference between corpse and core? Corpse is a body, usually a dead body mm -hmm. <laughs> of anything, really, corpse. In the poem, it is talking about uh, just giving examples of different ways to spell and different pronunciations. Core, a good way to remember the meaning of core is if you think about the United States military. Remember the Marines. The complete name of that organization is the Marine Corps. The Marine Corps of the United States of America. A next question. What are the complete words or the modern English words for oft and or? Just look at them and you will see the other word pop up. This is a good example about how translating does not really help you to understand the word. You have to think in English. What does OFT look like in modern English? Often, often, and or, over, over. And the last question, why dedicate a poem to daffodils? March 1st of every year is St. David's Day. And the national flower for Wales is the daffodil. And we celebrate that every March 1st, or at least the people in Wales do. And you will find an abundance of poems dedicated to daffodils.
So that is all for this presentation. Are you interested in more like this? I hope you are. I hope you enjoyed this short little conference about how we can use poetry to improve our English and to think in English. I myself, Jaime Chavoya, direct different workshops at the Mediateca. One is a book club. Right now, we are reading the book On the Road by Jack Kerouac. If you want to be part of that book club, it's in person. We'll see you every Friday at the Mediateca. Online, we have a poetry club where we will see lots and lots and lots of examples of poetry in English. We also have another, another workshop, which is called Weekly News. And that is a selected curated so, uh, workshop uh, for news of the week that will help us to understand more about United States history, United States institutions, and United States cultures, and politics in general. And then we have another one, which is creating stories, where it is a very intensely auditive experience, where you are encouraged to let your imagination fly and make stories. These are not the only workshops or activities that we have at the Mediateca. Remember, we have a lot of variety to offer you. We have more than 13 different languages that you can sign up for. We have workshops, workshops and conferences and clubs. We even give cooking classes sometimes. You will get personal assistance from an advisor to help you and walk with you, accompany you on your learning the language and meeting your personal language goals. And all of this, you can access it either online or in person. Remember, also, you can contact us if you have any questions or you want more information. Check us out at Mediateca at nsmorelia.unam.mx. We are on all main social networks. And you can also send us a WhatsApp message. So that is the end of this presentation. And y ahora voy a pasar al español. Y les, voy, les doy las, las más sinceras gracias por acompañarnos a esta conferencia y a nombre del maestro uh, Eduardo Altamirano, el coordinador de este ciclo de conferencias y de la maestra Karina Godina, la coordinadora de la Mediateca de la ENES Morelia, de la Escuela Nacional de Estudios Superiores Unidad Morelia de la Universidad Nacional Autónoma de México. Les damos las gracias por acompañarnos a esta conferencia. Recuerden, vamos a tener más conferencias cada lunes destinadas para acompañarles y ayudarles y, y entregarles, tal vez meterles una espinita de más, para que tengan más curiosidad sobre las culturas y las lenguas extranjeras. Pues muchas gracias. Eso es todo por hoy. Que tengan un excelente día.